So, Bot Residue Theorem with Applications. Okay. So, uh, yeah. A lot of what, I was, what I'll be talking about was covered in the previous lectures, but then a bunch of you weren't here then. So let me say a little bit about uh, the background first, intersection theory. So classical intersection theory, the classical version. Um, and I'll make it a little fancier in that um, what I mean by this is sort of oriented uh, cohomology, but just the geometric part. So, so what does that mean? What you have a bunch of theories. You have the cohomology. So I'll just call that A star. And what it really is, these are all coming from motivic theories. So the A star is really an A two star star. And uh, you use the second, you use the two variables when you want to prove things using localization and that type of thing. Um, but if you just want to do computations and move things around and push forward and pull backs and that type of thing, we're just going to be using this guy. But this is necessary at points. But um, that's where it comes from. And in the typical example, the basic example is the Chow ring. And we should view this as a functor just from smooth things over our fixed base field K to uh, graded rings, commutative graded rings, which not graded commutative, there's no signs involved. So if you have a map from Y to X, then you get the pullback map. Homomorphism of graded rings. Okay, and then you also have the uh, Borel-Moore homology. So this came up a lot in a bunch of talks, like Nils talks and uh, Sharanya's talk. Um, I'll just call it like this. And again, in the motivic setting, this really comes from a bi-graded thing, and it's the two-star star part. And the typical example here would be Chow groups graded by dimension. This is graded by co-dimension. And this has a functoriality, but it's defined on finite type, uh, separated, and what have you, uh, schemes, but only for projective or proper morphisms, and sends it to graded abelian groups. But um, <clears throat> so. You know, if you have your f from y to x proper, and then you get f lower star from a star to a star, functorial, of course. And this is this is these are naturally a upper star modules. So this is an a upper star module map, which is often referred to as the projection formula. Right. In other words, f lower star of uh, x times, uh, sorry, f upper star of x times y is x times f lower star of y. So the x would be in the cohomology and the y would be in the borel mohr homology. All right. Then you also have the purity property relating these two. So if you like Poincaré duality in a sense, so if you have z inside of x, closed immersion, but also smooth, both of them smooth, let's say then the, so again, see, since you have this guy, you can talk about cohomology with supports, which is not obvious if you just have the theory with the single grading, but you have a cohomology with supports. And uh, this would be isomorphic to something or other, to a in degree dimension of x minus star. OK, I think I did that right, hopefully. And then you have things like you have uh, churn classes of vector bundles. 
And allied with this is the projective bundle formula, which that's how you get the churn classes, but I'm not, I'm not going to need that for this talk. So if you have a vector bundle on some, so let's say x is smooth to make things easier, then you have the i churn class of v living in ai of x. And there's also a version with supports. If you have a section here, then you have a turn class for v uh, with, for the section living in the theory with supports, which then uh, is often useful to translate into the Borel-Moore homology. OK, and from these push forward maps, a particular case of this and the purity, I guess, well, just the, no, just you don't need that. But I'll say you get a push forward, you get a degree map. This is how you count things. So if you have your structure map Px, you can take the push forward from the Borel Moore in dimension 0 on x to the Borel Moore in dimension 0 on spec k, which then by the purity is just this thing here. And this is for from x to spec k uh, proper. OK, and if it happened to be smooth and proper, so for x also smooth, then this would be the co-dimension, dimension x things. And that's very often how you get these things. So for example, you put these two things together. If you have v on x, x is now smooth and proper. And you have the dimension of x is equal to the rank of v, so I'll call that d. Then you can take the top churn class of v, which is also known as the Euler class, and you can take its degree. And you get something in a 0 of k. All right. And very often for the Chow groups, for example, this is z. This is just the integers, and that's how you get how you count things with the degree map. Okay, and there's also so virtual things. There's also um, a f yeah. Let's see. You also have sort of virtual fundamental classes for perfect obstruction theory. So if you're not familiar with this, don't worry about it. Um, to, uh, that will come later, hopefully. Now, um, how do you get these theories from a, this thing comes, of course, from a spectrum in, uh, say, a ring spectrum, commutative ring spectrum object in uh, SH of K, and you get the cohomology and the borel moore homology by a six-functor, you know, six-functor stuff. So, we're not, also not going to be using that, but that's just how you generate these things. OK, any questions? This is sort of the classical story. So um, now what I'm more interested in is uh, quadratic in the title comes by looking at, um, yeah, so classical. Maybe I should say. Um, <clears throat> It, from the topology, the oriented means it's, it has uh, Tom classes for arbitra arbitrary vector bundles have uh, Tom isomorphisms and Tom classes. So if you're familiar with that point of view. So then you have the, um, the quadratic part usually comes from these SL oriented theories. I'll explain why that's quadratic in a, in a bit. And here it's the same story, but uh, of course, SL oriented means that you have Tom classes and a Tom isomorphism for bundles endowed with an isomorphism of the determinant of the bundle with the trivial bundle. Or if you like, a reduction of the group to S from GLN to SLN. All right, so you have the same story, you have cohomology. upper star, that's exactly the same. But um, uh, again, it's the two star star part. 
But the uh, basic example of this is the thing that uh, Niels Feld talked about, these uh, chow vit groups. Okay? And here, remember, because you fix this determinant, you can also twist by um, any vector bundle, but it really is a tantamount to twisting by the determinant of the bundle. So you think of this really as a functor. I'm not going to write down the category. because I'll get too confused. You take a smooth variety x with a line bundle, and then you get the twisted, the theory on x twisted by the line bundle. And again, this has products in the appropriate sense. If you have a twist by one line bundle and another line bundle, the products land in the twist by the tensor product. And of course, you have f upper star. If you have f from y to x and a line bundle L on x, then you have f upper star from a star xl to a star y s star l. So the obvious uh, functoriality if you include the line bundle. And then you also have uh, borel moore homology, which is, again, essentially the same thing. So same, the motivic version. And so I think Niels talked about, he wrote it just with a lower star on the Chalvit groups. So if you weren't at Niels' talk, um, let me I should say that, of course, the Chow groups are built out of algebraic cycles, which are just formal z-linear combinations of subvarieties, so subvarieties with integer coefficients. And the chow vit groups, uh, you replace the integer coefficients with uh, quadratic forms, an element in the grotendieck vit ring of the field of rational functions on the subvariety. And then since a quadratic form is not like an integer, an integer just stays being an integer no matter what you do with it along the variety. It's a constant along the variety. A quadratic form can degenerate on co-dimension one subvarieties of the variety. So uh, such a gadget looks more like a uh, chain or a cochain than a cycle. So you have an additional condition of the boundary uh, map measuring the degeneracy of the quadratic form on the various subvarieties that you have. These have to cancel out in order to get an object in an element in here. OK, so I hope that uh, very vague description uh, gives you at least some idea of how these things have some quadratic information. All right, so uh, again, you have a similar functoriality uh, just as before. So f floor star as before. But of course, you have to put in the, again, in this situation, when f is proper, so f proper, then you go from, uh, you know, it's the same story. You have to pull back the line bundle up. And that's what I did. Good. OK. Now, the purity is where you start to see uh, the use of these. I mean, up to now, it's just a placeholder. Why bother? So if, again, if you have z inside of x, let's say for simplicity smooth, both smooth, then the purity isomorphism or the Poincaré duality isomorphism looks like this. This is the same as the Borel-Moore theory in the same kind of degree on z. But the twist changes. You, of course, I'm going to write L. It really means you restrict L. And you twist it by the determinant of the normal bundle of z in x. OK, so what this uh, does <coughs> is um, if you, yeah, so maybe when I get to the degree map, you'll see where this, so you have Euler classes. That's another difference. Instead of having all churn classes in all degrees, you just have the analog of the top churn class. So if you have V on X rank R, then you get its Euler class. And again, 
you have a twist. It's twisted by the inverse of the determinant of V, and there's also one with supports. Let me not write that down. Uh, the degree map, oops, sorry, didn't want to do that. Didn't want to do that either. So uh, the degree map, again, looks formally the same. So you have x spec k proper, and you just take the degree map as just the lower star going from the. But now you have to use a trivial twist. And there's a, another nice feature, which makes things a little more flexible. Flexible. You have sort of a square invariance that the um, these twists by the line bundle. It's just like in a uh, case of orientation bundles on a real manifold. They only depend on the line bundle up to square. So there's a canonical isomorphism of uh, this with L tensor, the square of some line bundle, and similarly for the Borel-Moore homology. All right. Um, now, if you uh, put this together, let's see. Um, how can I say it? If you take, let's see. This right? Did I do this right? Let's see. Mm. Let's see. Somehow I think I did this. Something was a little strange here. Uh. No, this, this can't be right here. So this is probably not. What did I do wrong here? I did something wrong here. So, ah, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Maybe I should leave this off, <laughs> tell you what the right answer is here. Um, sorry. Let's just do the case where the you're taking the supports on X. So it's the whole thing. And you want to get the Borel-Moore homology on X. And there, uh, sorry, I somehow screwed up with the notation here. There, what you have to do is you, um, you have to twist by the differential, the orientation sheaf on X. I think that's correct. Anybody want to help me out here? I think this is correct. What's that? Ah, so minus, minus L. But up to a square, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about what's coming in. Yeah. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter, plus or minus. So up to squares, it doesn't matter. OK, so for a particular case, here, this guy here is the same as the co-dimension, dimension of x things on x twisted by omega x. So this is the important part here. When you, sorry, so I don't know why I got that all screwed up, but this is correct. So what that says, if you now look at the question of finding the degree of an Euler class of a bundle of rank equal to the dimension, when you put this together, you say if you have, sorry, up, wrong one. I'll get it right eventually. If you have um, your vector bundle on x, where the dimension of x is equal to the rank of v, then uh, you have the Euler class of v living in the 
theory here, twisted by the inverse of the determinant of v. On the other hand, you'd like to be able to take a degree map here. This is to um, a0 of k. But of course, you can't because the twists are different. So you see what you have to do. You have to find an isomorphism rho from the determinant of v or its inverse. Sometimes we phrase it this way to, maybe I'll put it this way here, to omega x tensor, some square of some line bundle. And then you can say, OK, this, this, this maps this determinant, this uh, cohomology, to this twist, uh, rho. And then, OK, well, I'm sorry that <laughs> the diagram got a little twisted here, but um, so to speak. And then uh, you can get rid of the square. And then you can take the degree by using the duality. So this degree map depends on the choice of this isomorphism. So let me call it degree rho. So in the numerative problems, what usually happens is you make your counting by trying to compute the degree of an Euler class of some bundle. And this says you need this extra data of a, what's called a relative orientation in order to make that computation in the uh, SL-oriented case. Now there's an even more special case, which we'll call SL eta, in, SL eta inverse oriented. So this is just a mix of terminologies. What this means is it's SL oriented and multiplication by eta, this is the algebraic Hopf map, uh, is an isomorphism on all the groups where it's, I mean, this, is, this only makes sense, of course, on the bi-graded theory. So uh, that's the condition. Let me give you the, so I gave some examples of the chow witt groups. Let me give the class, the simplest example of that. Um, we have the grotendieck witt ring of a, grotendieck witt ring of, say, a local ring or a ring. This forms a sheaf on, say, smooth varieties over your field for, let's say, the Nisnevich topology. And then um, you can take the Witt rings, which is the Grotendieck Witt rings, modulo the ideal generated by the hyperbolic forms. This forms a sheaf W on smooth varieties over K for the Nisnevich topology. And you look at, can look at the cohomology theory, which in its untwisted form, or let's say, let's give the twisted form, So what's this W of L? Well, I mean, if you have a quadratic form, it's a form from, you know, defined on some vector space with values in, you know, your field or values in the sheaf of local rings on your scheme. And instead of taking values in the sheaf of uh, the structure sheaf, you can take values in the thing which is locally the structure sheaf, namely a line bundle. And that's what this thing is. So this turns out to be uh, one of these SL-oriented theories on which uh, eta is invertible. And why is that? It's, well, it's even closely related to the um, other two theories that I've mentioned. Uh, in the following way.
Um, So remember we had this, we mentioned these Chow-Vit groups. So this can, has, also has a cohomological uh, definition. It's, as Niels mentioned, you can take the sheaf of Milner-Vit K groups and twist them by L, and that gives you a definition of this thing. Uh, the Chow groups, you have the formula of Bloch and Cotto. This is just the cohomology of the Milner K sheaves. And Nils explained how, um, if you look at the presentation of this guy, um, there's this element eta in there. And when you send eta to 0, it writes this sheaf as a quotient of this sheaf. And so that gives you some kind of natural transformation from this SL-oriented theory here to this oriented theory. On the other hand, if you invert eta, then everything ends up in negative degree here, because this thing has degree minus 1. And this thing in negative degree is just the sheaf of Vit groups. So this maps to my cohomology in the Vit sheaf. Okay, And so we have this uh, diagram. Now what does this do to the coefficient rings? The coefficient ring here, remember, was chow 0 of k, which was z. The coefficient ring here is chow tilde 0 of k. And uh, this milner vit in degree 0 was just the groten dieck vit ring. And here, it's obviously just the vit ring. OK, so when we have a similar diagram here on the coefficient rings, and in fact, um, <clears throat> we also mentioned Morel's theorem that the grotendieck vit ring over K is the endomorphism of the sphere spectrum in our motivic stable homotopy category. So that says that all cohomology theories really are modules over this ring. Of course, uh, the oriented ones, you do the same thing. You make the sphere oriented, and the endomorphisms just become uh, Z. So all the oriented theories are, well, z-algebras, not anything surprising there. And then when you make a SL-oriented theory uh, eta invertible, it becomes a module over the Vit ring. So that's where the quadratic information comes in. Uh, now I should mention one last thing. If you, this is for k, but it's true essentially for any field. If you take uh, the kernel of this map, this is just a rank map. You take a quadratic form on V and you send it to the dimension of V. This is the kernel of that map. Now you mod it out here by a quadratic form of rank 2. So you get a rank map to Z mod 2. And uh, this square is a Cartesian square. And in fact, the, um, so it says that the kernel of the mod 2 rank map on the Vit ring is the same as the kernel of the rank map on the Grotendieck Vit ring. In other words, all the essentially quadratic information contained in the Grotendieck Vit ring uh, is maintained when you pass to the Vit ring. So you have the following strategy for trying to get uh, quadratic refinements of enumerative invariants. Well, you have the integer invariant by taking classical uh, theory. And then uh, this theory actually is a lot simpler than this one, because you see this one is a mixture of the classical theory and the quadratic theory. And it turns out that the formulas you get for various operations are rather wildly different uh, here than they are here. And that makes things here quite complicated. Uh, if you think about it another way, um, this is Morel's heuristic, is uh, you look at what happens if your, let's say your field is contained in the reals. So you can look at what happens under complex realization and uh, then the numerical invariants you get, you can pass from the Chow ring to usual singular cohomology, and the numerical invariants you get don't change. So this is detected by looking at what happens over C. And it's a very nice fact that the, uh, when you pass to the real points, this type of group just gives you the singular cohomology of the real points, let's say, with uh, two inverted. 
there's a, there's a business with two inverted having to do with the fact that the uh, algebraic Hopf map uh, on the real points is just multiplication by two from S1 to S1. So inverting that inverts two, but other than that, this is telling you about the singular cohomology of the real points, and you can imagine that uh, formulas for Euler classes on real points are going to be very different from formulas for top churn classes on complex points, and that's really the case. Okay, so with that little bit of heuristics, let me continue. Any questions before I can go further? Oh, oh, characteristic two is something I want to avoid at all costs. So characteristic k not equal to two. Thanks for mentioning that. We will have no more discussion of characteristic two in my presence, please. <laughs> so OK, good. Uh, no discussion <laughs> is what I said, and that's what I mean. All right, so let me give an elementary example just to illustrate this, and I want to especially point out the, oh, this is really awful, this diagram, but uh, where the orientations come in. So the elementary example is counting lines on a hypersurface, x of degree d, inside of Pn. And uh, if you take d equal to 2n minus 3, you'd expect that a general smooth hypersurface of that degree would have finitely many lines. And why would you expect that? Well, uh, lines, of course, in Pn are planes inside of affine n, plane, n space of dimension n plus 1. So there are this Grassmannian of two planes in uh, n plus 1 space parametrizes the lines in Pn. And this is the universal two-plane bundle inside of the trivial bundle of rank n plus 1 on the Grassmannian. And this thing has dimension equal to 2 times n minus 2. It's easy to see. And now if this thing here is the um, zeros of a homogeneous form of this degree, then what you can do is you can take, um, you get an associated section. Uh, so you can take your form and you can restrict it as a homogeneous function on each of these two planes. And that gives you a section in the d -th symmetric power of the dual, right? The dual being functions, linear functions on here, the d -th symmetric power would be homogeneous functions of degree d fiber-wise on this thing. So your f gives you this thing. And of course, the points, if this vanishes on a point corresponding to a line, this is if and only if the line L is contained in X. Now, if uh, this bundle has rank uh, equal, well, how many symmetric forms are there of degree D in two variables? They're D plus one of them. So this has rank D plus one. So if D plus one is equal to this, in other words, if D is equal to this, you'd expect to have finitely many zeros of a general section. All right. And so the number of lines, let's be number of lines, should be equal to the degree of the top churn class of this sim D of E2 dual, because a section with finitely many zeros is exactly what computes the top churn class of a bundle, just as it would compute the Euler class. Right. So, uh, and you can compute such a thing by figuring out what this guy is in terms of the, C, the first and second churn class of uh, this bundle here, and then using the um, uh, Schubert calculus. So since I'm running, rapidly running out of time, let me not do that calculation. But let's do the analog a little bit in detail, the analog for a quadratic count. Let me, ju let me just say that the, this degree, it's, it's easy, but it's a, little, it's a little complicated, a little messy. The formula you get, it requires a little bit of work. It involves a lot of factorials and this, that, and the other thing. It's a little messy. But uh, let's, what happens for the quadratic count? You do the same thing. You have the same setup. 
but you just use the uh, Euler class, and let me put a W here, and this would live in H uh, D plus 1 on the Grossmannian of the bit sheaf, but of course we have this twist, twisted by the inverse determinant of this bundle. On the other hand, the canonical sheaf on the Grossmannian, well, the Grossmannian uh, lives by the Plucker embedding in some projective space. Let me not figure out what that is. It's, well, I guess it's n plus 1, choose 2, minus 1, whatever. It's the Plucker embedding, so it has um, the hyperplane bundle here, it gives you the uh, O of 1. Uh, generate, which is actually a generator of the Picard group here. Let me just call that O of 1. And this thing turns out to be uh, this guy here. That's an easy calculation. And when you calculate this determinant, it's also not hard to do, it turns out to be um, O of uh, D plus 1 times D over 2. But of course, let's see. Uh, d plus 1 is 2n minus 2, so this thing is just equal to n minus 1 times 2n uh, minus 3. And 2n minus 3 is an odd number, and this thing n minus 1 is, of course, congruent to minus n plus 1. So this is congruent to minus n plus 1 mod 2. In other words, and these are canonical isomorphisms. I mean, there's no... There's not really any choice involved here. So that says canonically you have an identification of the, this determinant is then canonically, that's my row, identified with the omega on the Grossmannian times some square. And the square is also canonical. Okay, and via this row, then you have this degree map, which is there are not really any choices left anymore. And this goes from... Well, you can take the degree of this Euler class of this sim d e2 dual. And I'll tell you the answer. It's actually quite simple. Well, it's equal to, well, let's see. I think d looks like it has to be odd, so there's no question. It's actually equal to d double factorial. Well, times, you know, 1 in the... And what's this d double factorial? It's d times d minus 2 times d minus 4, et cetera, down to 3. That's the d double factorial. So that's a computation I made in general for the uh, Euler class of the sim d of a rank 2 bundle. OK, but it's act, you know, there it is. It's quite simple. Good. But I just wanted to point out that um, you have the same kind of yoga of calculating degrees of Euler classes, but you have this business where you really have to use something, some information to find uh, an orientation, and depending on the geometric situation, can be easy, like it was in this case, or it can be hard, like it is in other cases. Okay, so um, the title was about Bott residue theorem, so let me just remind you about the classical Bott residue theorem. So this is also something used to calculate degrees of churn classes or other things. And this was discussed uh, in Charanya's talk. So uh, the classical one uses the group, algebraic group G, a torus, which, so GM, well, this is the classical algebraic one by uh, Edidine Graham. And this should be acting on your variety X of choice. And you have um, equivariant, let's use equivariant Chow groups. This is defined by, uh, constructed by this Borel construction where you take an algebraic approximation to a uh, contractible space on which the group acts freely. Okay, so it's just like in topology, except there's an algebraic version of it. And you also have a similar uh, Borel-Moore 
version. All right. <clears throat> and then um, you have two basic results, one which, which uh, Charanya called the, local, the uh, concentration theorem. So since my concentration is not what it used to be, I guess I'll just stick with that. I used to call this a localization theorem, but she called localization theorem something else. This is um, Aran, Aranya, Khan, Latinsov, Park, and Ravi. Uh, in a special case, what it says is um, you have your uh, torus acting on x. You take the inclusion of the fixed points into x. Of course, they prove this in the setting of, a, of stacks. I'm just going to talk about the case of acting on a scheme. And this gives you uh, i lower star from the equivariant Chow groups, the T equivariant Chow groups on XT to the T equivariant Chow groups on X. And this guy is actually quite easy to compute in terms of the Chow groups on the fixed points. So for example, the classical use of this is the fixed points are a finite set of points. And you just get the uh, Chow groups of X tensored with the Chow groups of the equivariant Chow groups of a point. Maybe I should say what that is, that the um, equivariant Chow groups of uh, spec K or of a point, it doesn't really matter. This is what you usually call the Chow groups of BT. It's just a polynomial ring in R generators, where the generators are just the pullback by the ith factor of the line bundle on uh, BGM, and BGM is... Uh, p infinity, so you have the O of 1 on uh, P infinity. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But thank you, yeah. Okay, so, but for stacks and things. So, generalized by. Is that okay? We can stick with it. Compromise. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's just a polynomial ring. And as Charanya pointed out in her talk, these EIs are just the pullback by the height projection of the C1 of O of 1 on P infinity. Okay, so this thing is an isomorphism after inverting some uh, P, which is not zero in this um, child group, and I'll emphasize that it's not constant. It has a positive degree in here. And that yields um, a bot residue formula. Um, let's see. So that would yield a, uh, how am I doing time here? Oh, not so great. Okay. Title. For simplicity, let's assume that this guy here is just a finite set of points. Makes life easy. Then, if we have, uh, let's let's say we want to compute the um, some churn class of some vector bundle on my x. This has my T action on it. I assume that the vector bundle admits the T action over the T action on X. Then if I want to compute, really I want to compute the equivariant guys here. This guy here is gotten by taking the sum. So I have the inclusion 
here, and I would take um, the ij lower star of the equivariant churn class of ij upper star of v divided by the um, top churn class of the uh, tangent bundle on x um, pulled back. Again, after localization, after inverting some possibly other p in the Okay, and what's, what's useful about this is this is entirely in terms of representation theory. You just have a vector bundle on a point. Well, that's just a vector space with a t-action. So you can compute the numerator and denominator here by uh, knowing enough representation theory. So that's an easy calculation. Okay, and I, I guess I should put a t here. Good. So hopefully that's correct. Um, maybe I should say one thing about the idea why does this work? Well, uh, Sharanya also mentioned this, but you use Thomason slice theorem plus a localization argument, different localization, uh, you know, splitting up into open subsets and closed complements to reduce to the case of the following. You want to show if you have y cross z with a t action on y and a trivial action here, um, such that y is a um, homogeneous space where h is a proper subgroup of t. In other words, the t orbit, this is the y would be some t, y cross a point, would be a t orbit of positive dimension. Then um, you can take, the take a character of t, a non-trivial character, with kernel of chi containing h. And what that tells you, if you get an associated, every character gives you a line bundle on, on bt. And the point is that this condition, that um, its kernel contains h, means when you pull it back to y, uh, the line bundle becomes trivial. And what that says is if you take c1 of l of chi, which is living in uh, chow one of bt, this pulls back to uh, zero in um, the chow one of y cross z t. Okay, so now that means if you invert this thing, you've killed all the chow groups, uh, equivariant chow groups of y cross z. And there's also only sort of finitely many of these uh, types that occur. So that gives you the p. You just take a product of these c1 of l chi i's is what works. OK, is that uh, more or less clear? That's the idea. Inverting this, so you only have finitely many of these orbit types. And uh, each one of these guys, if you invert it, will kill the cohomology of this guy, and that kills all the cohomology of the open complement of the fixed points. Because on the open complement of the fixed points, the orbits will all have positive dimension. And so they all look like that up to some stratification. All right. So uh, let me just say, how do we do this? So in fact, the argument that Sharanya gave uh, works completely well for other theories besides oriented theories. I mean, this, I did this for the Chow ring. Uh, she, her argument says, well, it works fine for oriented theories. That's completely fine because the um, oriented, if you take instead of the Chow groups, you take some oriented theory A, uh, the computation of the equivariant of the A star of BT is essentially the same. You get um, A star of, you get A star of base field to join on the E's. So it's the same argument, same construction. But, uh, and the argument actually works for an arbitrary theory. So why didn't she uh, say it that way? The reason is there's a problem for A star arbitrary, let's say SL oriented. Or let's make it, let's look at the purely quadratic story. 
let's take this like this equals h star w. The problem is, is that, well, the first turn class of a line bundle becomes the Euler class of a line bundle. And this is 0 <laughs> for all line bundles. In fact, if you take the Euler class in this theory, for any odd rank bundle, you get 0. So uh, you get a theorem, but inverting these things just means you're inverting 0. And you know, 0 equals 0 is a theorem, but not very useful. So what's the solution to this? So, so this leads to the theorem 0 equals 0. OK, so what's the solution to this? Um, keep track of this. Oh, I still have a little bit of time. So the first solution is uh, suggested by a theorem of Anyanevsky. I think I got that right. Which says that um, if you take the um, a star is now an SL eta inverted oriented theory, then A star of BSL2, or BSL2 to the R, say, is A star of K adjoin E1 up to ER, where the EI are the pullbacks by the ith projection of the Euler class of the tautological rank 2 bundle on BSL2. So what's the tautological bundle? Well, you get a bundle on BSL2 by a representation of SL2, and you just take the representation putting SL2 inside of GL2. This is the thing that gives you, you know, E2 on BSL2. All right, so this looks very much like the statement of uh, see, so now you have Euler classes of rank 2 bundles, and they're not 0. They're actually so power series or polynomial generators for this theory. So you're in good shape. But there's a problem with this solution that there are many uh, SL2 homogeneous spaces. Say, you know, uh, of positive dimension, let's call it y, with um, essentially the, let's just do the case containing um, a free uh, h star b s l 2 module as a sum n. In other words, you're never going to be able to get rid of these things by inverting something. You don't just, and the, the simplest example is you take, um, you take uh, the, the projective space on non-degenerate symmetric 2 by 2 matrices with SL2 acting in the usual way. You, know, you have a matrix M goes to you know, A, M, A transpose, the usual action. And this is one of these examples. This, this thing actually has essentially the same um, equivariant cohomology as BSL2. It's even a little bit bigger, has an extra sum end in it. But. So that's, now you can uh, write down some nice uh, subgroups for which that's not true, but they're basically uh, the parabolic subgroups. So the Borel side of SL2 is good. And for products, you get things which are essentially of that form or diagonal subgroup. So there are some actions which, uh, for which that's useful, but it's not a great situation. So there's a, a solution two, which also has its problems, but it gives you a little bit more to work with. Instead of using BSL, instead of using SL2, let's let n inside of SL2. Uh, this contains the diagonal torus GM. This is the set of matrices of this form. Uh, this is you take the GM and add on this matrix, this uh, order four matrix. Let's call this sigma. This is the normalizer of the torus. In 
SL2. And uh, the problem two so disappears. So, so it turns out if you take Y, a homogeneous space for n to the r of uh, dimension bigger than zero, then um, actually there exists a p in z one up to e r, which of course maps to uh, w. So I'm working with the in this case my a is the Fitzsheaf cohomology, so this a star of k is just w of k. And um, uh, so p times the n to the r equivariant cohomology of this thing is 0. OK, so there's again, so I cheated. This thing here is non-zero in here and of degree bigger than 2 or bigger than 0 in any case. But you notice I'm mapping to here. And uh, for some fields, this Witt group is rather small. Like for a finite field, this is just uh, z mod 2 cross z mod 2 or z mod 4. And so if this p has all coefficients divisible by 4, it'll go to 0 here. So uh, this also has its problems. But on the positive side, if your field has a real embedding, or for every real embedding, the corresponding signature map gives you a copy of the integers inside the Witt group. And that says for such fields, uh, something in here which is non-zero will give you something which is uh, non, you know, not a zero divisor after you invert two. That, that's what will happen. So OK, you lose the two torsion, which is a very important invariant in quadratic forms. But you retain all the signature information by inverting p. So that's the situation. All right, so um, let me, oh, I'm out of time, it seems. So let me just um, mention one uh, nice result. Um, I didn't say anything about virtual localization, so I'll just say it. You have these localization theorems for virtual fundamental classes, and that also works in the, um, so you also have a uh, virtual localization. And you can use these methods to compute Donaldson-Thomas invariants. So for example, uh, Annalos Fierheber used this method to compute the, so to speak, quadratic dt invariants, or at least the first few of them, some of these, for p3. In other words, for Hild n of p3. Here again, you need to get orientation information. And that was the topic of Marco Raballo's talk, getting orientations. It turns out the fact that p3 is a spin manifold, its canonical class is divisible by 2, means you have the necessary orientation for the associated perfect obstruction theory on this guy. And she finds the following things for n, make a little chart. So let's just say the quadratic degree, really its signature. So for the odd ones, you get 0. And for 2, 4, and 6, you get uh, 10, 25, and minus 50. And uh, on the other hand, if you take this McMahon function, which is uh, what people use to compute the, the uh, classical Donaldson-Thomas invariance in this case, you since all the Odd ones are zero. You should. You want this to be a counting function for all these things. You use q squared, and lo and behold, this is exactly okay. So uh, this is this McMahon function. M of q counts two-dimensional partitions of uh, n. It's the generating function for that, and this is what shows up in the. Uh, analogous uh, generating function for the classical DT invariant. So that's where we are with this story. Hopefully, uh, Analos will be able to fill in the dot, dot, dots. And uh, I guess I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Yes. Since you mentioned generating functions, is this a thing for which we expect that there is a closed formula? Is it maybe already known? Or what? Well, uh, yeah, the, the classical case, the classical case if, is if you take m minus q to the degree of the third churn class of the omega 2 on your x, for x is smooth threefold, this is equal to the you know, sum of these, uh, I'll call it dt n x times q to the n. That, that's a theorem. So these are the ones you would, you have a virtual fundamental class here, you compute its usual degree in the Chow ring, and this is, this is a theorem. And the, the way the proof goes is that, um, so uh, Malik, Nekrasov, Konkov, and Pandora Pandey made this computation for uh, smooth toric threefolds, like P3, P1 cubed, et cetera, using localization methods. So that's what inspired uh, Analos's work. And then uh, after that, there's a degeneration formula, so-called double-point cobordism formula, which uh, allows you to deduce this formula because the, these toric threefolds generate the algebraic cobordism ring in dimension three. So once you have such a formula uh, for the generators, then you get it in general. Now, um, at this point, even the toric case is still a problem because um, when you get to degree, the next degree, degree eight, I think that's right, the, up to these first degrees, when you take the torus, the, you, get an, you need to get an n action, and you get a, so there's a natural n action on P4. The problem is the torus is smaller than a, a three-dimensional torus. It's only a one-dimensional torus, and that means that the uh, fixed ideals, uh, it's a little easier to be a fixed ideal. So once you get to uh, n equals eight, then you have actually one uh, positive dimensional families of these fixed uh, ideals. And then uh, you can still use a localization theorem, but the computation is more difficult. So in these first three cases, you only have to use the virtual localization at finitely many points. Uh, so that's the issue. And uh, we're still trying to figure out <laughs> the uh, MNOP proof, why they were able to actually get the whole thing without uh, a huge amount of work. So they're able to get, they do a local calculation on C3 with a T3 action, and then uh, they're able to get that to work in general, but then, uh, so they get sort of the, all the answers for the local case, and then they're able to bootstrap that up to get uh, this type of formula in, in general. And that part we haven't really figured out how, to, how it works. So there's sort of two uh, principal problems. One is that the, this localization method is a little too weak to bring things down to a, a finite set of points, and the other is uh, how you actually get this particular uh, function out of it, it's also a little mysterious. So. But we do have a candidate for replacing this thing. Uh, it turns out it should be a bundle on, not on x, but on Hilb 2 of x, which fortunately is a smooth variety. You get Hilb 2 of x by taking x cross x, blowing up the diagonal, and then modding out by the z2 action. And uh, I think there, we think there's a bundle on that which kind of looks like the descent of uh, the P1 star of omega 2 plus P2 star of omega 2 on x. And then you have to do something along this uh, blown up diagonal to make it extend to be something where the quotient gives you something locally free, and that seems to work. And that seems to be a bundle which will work in that formula. So you'd have to take C6 of that bundle would be the exponent. But thanks for the question. Are there more questions? Well, it's a signature. It's the signature. So we're calculating. Uh, the, the point is you have a virtual fundamental class on this Hilb n. So this, this exists for every n. There's some perfect obstruction theory. You have a virtual class, and uh, you have a degree. And this lives in w of whatever field you're in. So that's, that's the, or you could take the chow vit gadget that would live in Chow in the GW of the field. But let's concentrate on this one. That's living here. And um, 
the quadratic part is that, this, as I mentioned, this localization method sort of kills all the two torsion. So it's only really uh, reasonable to try and calculate this for in the case where your field is R, and you're trying to calculate, in that case, the signature map from W of R to the integers is an isomorphism. So this signature is really talking about, uh, yeah, the signature in the Witt group of the reals, which is just Z by the signature map. So that's, that's the quadratic information. Yeah, thanks for the question.